Well, today I'm going to talk to you about five things that really bother me about the world I live in. And most of these are around science. So I asked a friend of mine who's actually a professor in Oxford University to actually answer some of these questions. And he's got back to me. So here we go. And it's Tim for Hat Engage. First of all, a disclaimer. Now, I don't believe in every conspiracy theory that comes along. I definitely don't believe the Earth is flat because that would cause far more problems than if the Earth was a globe. I do believe in UFOs. I don't have any choice about that because I've seen one close up. I do believe that there is a problem with NASA. I do believe that basically NASA lies. I don't know the reason for this. So bear that in mind as you watch the rest of this video. So let's start with the aircraft's primary flight instrument, the Attitude Direction Indicator, or ADI. Now for safety reasons, all this is, is a gyroscope, and you can see that in this film here. And the only electronics in there is something that occasionally pulses a pair of coils, just to keep that gyroscope spinning at around 20,000 RPM. And in fact, if you disconnect it electrically, it will continue behaving in exactly the same way. This is the safety feature, this is why it's the primary flight instrument. If you lose all electricity and all hydraulics, your ADI will continue to work, allowing you to navigate and land safely. There is a bit of a problem with this. Nowadays we have aircraft that fly distances of well over a thousand miles around the globe. The way that a gyroscope works, and I strongly advise you to watch Eric Laithwaite's uh, lecture series from Imperial College and this is rather old but it does rub in the point that a gyroscope provides its own inertial frame of reference. So one of two things should be happening. If the pilot is using his primary flight instrument as he is trained to do then he should as in the right hand image here carry on flying in a straight line and find himself in outer space after a thousand miles or so. Clearly this doesn't happen. If he looks at his altimeter and flies, then he should find his primary flight instrument wildly at variance with anything else. So WTF? I don't know. I asked my friend, he came back, and his answer was rather revealing. The physics around gyroscopes is very poorly understood, and he can't figure out why this is the situation either. But like me, he agrees that the Earth is unlikely to be flat. So what's going on? Nobody knows. And this is a question that unsettles me. Because if we're this far out about such a seemingly basic area of physics, what else are we wrong about? So the second thing that bothered me was the thermosphere. Now, this extends from 95 kilometers to 600 kilometers. And the temperature of the thermosphere the temperature of the atmosphere is varying between around 500 degrees centigrade and 2500 degrees centigrade during the day. Now, this worries me, or worried me, for the simple reason that I, I, you kind of think about it and you think, well, how on earth do the materials in satellites and so on survive this? Well, I'm glad to say this problem's been uh, explained to my satisfaction by my friend uh, at Oxford and basically the reason is the atmosphere up there is so thin that for every air molecule that impacts a satellite it's trying to warm up somewhere between five and ten thousand molecules that constitute the steel or aluminium or paint or whatever that it's hitting and so immediately you've got a factor of ten thousand or so in the energy transfer equation so you think about it you've got one gas molecule and don't forget the amount of energy it takes to raise the temperature of a gas molecule is less anyway than it takes to raise the temperature of a steel or paint or aluminium molecule. And so the actual amount of energy that's transferred is very minimal. Now the gas molecule can't transfer all its energy anyway, uh, plus it's got less energy in it than would take to 
raise the temperature of a single steel molecule and the end result is that you're looking at a few thousandths of a degree temperature rise even if the atmosphere up there is at 2500 degrees centigrade and this is why it's totally ignorable and in fact if you look on uh, NASA's calculations for satellites they do totally ignore it they go totally by the amount of energy that the satellite would absorb from the Sun so this has explained away for me the whole thermosphere issue and you'll find several YouTube videos that actually mention the thermosphere and say this is why satellites are impossible and in fact that is a whole load of cobblers. So on to the next thing. The third thing that bothered me was why don't we have a real picture of the Earth from space? Now, at first I thought this was a load of rubbish because if you go on NASA's website, for example, you'll find dozens of official pictures of the Earth from space. But then when you look at them more closely, you'll find that none of them are even consistent with each other. The continents are all different sizes, the colours are wildly different, the actual shape of the Earth is different in some of them from another. So they all seem to be worked over. Plus there's the most famous picture that everyone has ever seen, which is called the Blue Marble. And that is so obviously photoshopped, the cloud layer, when you look at it, um, it's just ridiculous. So why are NASA photoshopping these and not showing us actual pictures? And even the pictures of the Earth taken from the Moon are just plain wrong. If you look at one of my other videos, you'll see that I actually did a model, a 3D model of the Moon and the Earth, and what the view would have been like from the orbiting NASA spacecraft of the Earth rise over the Moon. And the Earth is totally the wrong size in the NASA pictures. This just beggars belief. Because you have to remember that the Earth is something like three times the diameter of the Moon, and when you're seeing it even from that distance, it shouldn't be as small as NASA is showing it. Because NASA is showing it about the same size as a supermoon would be seen from the Earth. And that is just so stupid, it beggars belief. Now there is a recent satellite, I forget its name, that orbits about a million miles out, which is supposed to be taking pictures of the Earth from space continuously. Well, if you look at the pictures where the Moon actually comes between the Earth and the spacecraft, you get exactly the opposite problem. The Moon is too damn small, because the Moon is nearer to the spacecraft than the Earth and NASA don't seem to be able to get this right. It's really weird. So what exactly are they hiding? I mean, I don't understand this one at all. And nobody else I've talked to understands it either. If anyone's got any good ideas, please leave them in the comments. Here's the fourth thing worries me. Now, in the 1960s, videotape recording was in its infancy, but everyone used to record videos onto two-inch VCR tape. Now, when I say everyone, I mean TV studios. Well, the Apollo images had a very curious and convoluted way of getting straight out to the public. I mean, they didn't really get straight out. The data was beamed down from the moon, supposedly, into an Australian dish, because that was the only one that faced in the correct direction at the time. It was then transmitted to NASA and the people who actually recorded, recorded not from the original feed, but from a large TV screen. And this is why the quality of those Apollo images, those television images that we all saw of Armstrong stepping onto the moon, are so bad. Now, this is a bit insane. The feed wasn't made available, and NASA don't have any of the original recordings of this feed, and they must have recorded it. I mean, you're doing this huge mission and you're, you're proclaiming your success to the world surely surely they must have recorded this feed so we can get some better quality pictures and better quality video of the moon landings now apparently they don't have the tapes anymore 
And it's not just these videotapes that have gone missing. Every single piece of telemetry from the Apollo missions has been scrubbed. It doesn't exist anymore. And this is just insane. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, from a normal record-keeping point of view, you would guard these things with your life. They're gold dust. If you ever needed to do the same things again, you would want to study that telemetry. You would want to look at the telemetry of the astronauts for medical reasons, to see the effects of being on the moon but none of that telemetry exists now why on earth would nasa wish to get rid of all that information it just does not make any sense to me this is another one that no one can answer i have my own theories about this but that's the fourth thing that worries me and it's closely related to the fifth thing and here's the fifth thing that worries me and yes it's related to number four and it's nasa again now, NASA managed to go to the moon, apparently, in 1969. I believe they did get there, but I don't think they got back. And here's the reason. Now, NASA are making a big fuss at the moment on the Orion project about the heat shields and about radiation shields. Well, why the fuss about the heat shields? Well, when a spacecraft enters Earth's atmosphere from an area outside low Earth orbit, it's travelling between two and three times as fast as it would if just simply returning from Earth orbit. So the heat shield itself has to withstand far greater temperatures and a much rougher descent into the atmosphere. This obviously was solved within 10 years in the Apollo project. Yet now they're saying we haven't got that technology anymore. We're having to research it all over again and we've lost the recipe. Now, I don't actually believe that. I mean, it's one thing throwing away all the telemetry tapes from the Apollo missions, but it's a quite another getting rid of basic spaceflight technology. And what's all this about radiation shields? Now, surely we can travel to the moon without radiation shields and stay there for a while. After all, the Apollo astronauts did exactly that. Because there was no shielding on the spacecraft used in the Apollo mission, and there was no shielding in the suits they wore on the moon's surface, which is even worse because the amount of radiation on the moon's surface is pretty large. Certainly enough to kill you after a few days. Does anyone else have an explanation for this? Other than that there is something seriously awry with what we think happened on the Apollo missions. If so, leave it in the comments, I'd like to hear it. So I have an explanation for one of these things that bother me, which is number two. I think I have an explanation for number four and five. This is what I believe happened in the moon landing. And I do believe that we did land men on the moon. Now, what I believe happened is that we sent some very brave people up to the moon and they died on the surface of the moon. And this is why NASA cannot possibly allow any telemetry transmissions because comparing the telemetry transmissions to the actual uh, video would prove that the video and the telemetry don't actually go together in other words every piece of imagery that we have from the Apollo missions was faked as has been said before and the real giveaway to me about the image faking is nothing to do with lighting, direction or anything else. It's quite simply the crosshairs on the pictures that they took because the crosshairs on the Hasselblad camera are actually a part of the camera. They're on a frosted glass screen inside the camera and there is no way that bits of those crosshairs can go missing, whole crosshairs can go missing, Crosshairs can suddenly drift into a new position from picture to picture, as happens in the Apollo stills. So although the videos may have actually been real, the actual stills taken, in my mind, are 100% faked. 100% faked. So our merry crew, who we know of as the men who visited the moon, simply sat around in a low earth orbit for a few days and then returned leaving some very dead astronauts on the actual moon and that is what i believe actually happened now if someone else can come up with a more plausible explanation that explains away 
numbers four and five on my list. Please go ahead. Um, I don't actually believe that the whole moon mission was faked. I believe that the actual way that it was done was more in the uh, manner of a conjuring trick and there is some reality and some fake in there. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video and found it thought provoking. If you have, please like, share and subscribe. If you want me to do a longer video on what I think went on with the moon landings, then let me know and I'll post one. So, have fun and I'll see you soon.